some of your best decisions are going to end in failure. You're not the same person you were yesterday, and you think that solves the problem. Wrong. It makes it worse. Welcome to The Big Question, the series from Euronews where we analyze some of the biggest topics on the business agenda. Now, in this episode, we're welcoming Professor Olivier Siboni of HEC Paris to discuss noise, bias, and how we can stop ourselves from making bad decisions. So, Olivier, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, one of the big points of your research is noise. Can you actually explain to us what that is? Because if I'm not mistaken, we're not just talking about sound, are we? No. No, we're not. We're talking about noise in judgments. And what we mean by noise is simply the variability of those judgments. The fact that those judgments can kind of randomly be very different from one person to the next and even from one moment to the next in the same person. So is noise necessarily a bad thing then because variability, diversity is a good thing, surely? Of course, and that's a great question because on many things we are you know, we, we are used to assuming that diversity is actually a good thing, and on many things we're right. You know, if you like Mozart and I prefer the Rolling Stones, that's fine. We, we can agree to disagree, right? Diversity is great, it's a matter of taste. If we are in a marketplace and we are competing, and you think that the best way to develop a new drug is to take this particular technology, and I think it's to take that particular technology, it's great that we disagree because the best Technology is going to win in the marketplace, and the fact that many opportunities compete and that there is a mechanism to decide which one is the best is actually very productive. But in many situations, diversity is actually not that great. If you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you, you have this disease, and you're not quite sure, so you go see another doctor, and he tells you, no, not at all, you have something completely different. You don't say, oh, diversity is great. You say, one of these two doctors at least, maybe both, is wrong. Right? So what this tells you is, as soon as we believe there is a correct answer, the fact that two people have different opinions means that at least one of them is wrong. And before we say that diversity is always good, we should bear that in mind. There are lots of things for which it's good, and there are many, many things for which it's actually a sign of error. What sorts of things can create this noise or this diversity, these divergences in opinion and judgment? Well, we've, we've broken down noise into three components, and they're fairly intuitive. So let's take the example of judges. Suppose mm. you have a number of different judges, and you give them the same case, and you ask them, you know, this person has been found guilty given the circumstances and so on, how many years of prison will you sentence that person to? The variability of those judgments is actually much larger than you would expect. It's shockingly large. That some judges will, for instance, sentence someone to one year in prison and others to life in prison. So where does that come from? What are the components of this variability? That some judges are just more severe and others are more lenient. That's something we call level noise. It's the, 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 the difference in average levels from one person to the next. Then there is something that also comes to mind very naturally in this example, which is the old saying that justice is what the judge ate for breakfast, right? So if the judge is in a good mood or in a bad mood, that will make a difference. We actually have econometric studies that show that there is some effect, not a very large effect, by the way, of the temperature, the, the outside temperature and the severity of judgments. When it's very hot, judges are in a bad mood, they tend to be more severe. There is also some studies showing that when the local football team lost the game on the weekend, judgments are going to be more severe on the Monday. That's what we call occasion noise. It's the fact that the same person with the same facts will, from one day to the next, looking at the same case, actually not be the same person. You're not the same person you were yesterday. Mm -hmm. And the third one is this. You and I can be different judges. We, we are different people. Maybe we are, on average, just as severe as each other, right? But you are more severe with people who are repeat offenders because you think that's unacceptable. And maybe I'm more severe with first-time criminals because I think it's you know, the, the right time to send a message. So we have different personalities, personal histories, biases, prejudices. And that makes us different in the way we look at each case idiosyncratically. We call this pattern noise. And that's by far the largest source of noise.
What is the noise that can cause bias when we're interviewing candidates and how can people make sure that they choose the best candidate and block out all the, the noise? First, structure your judgments. So everybody will tell you they have a job description. But very few people have actually given a lot of thought to their job description, have actually asked, what do we really value? How much weight do we give to these various attributes? If you want people who are really smart, don't evaluate whether they are really smart by interviewing them. It's not a great way. Give them a test of cognitive ability. Right? And that will be an independent source of information that helps you to structure a decision along many different dimensions. Because when you're then interviewing them, you can test for other things. Second idea, if people are different in their judgments, if different people are going to have different opinions about the same candidates, that is noise. Leverage it. Make it your friend instead of letting it be, be, be your enemy. And the way to do this is to have multiple people evaluate the same candidate. Now, of course, you will say, oh, but we do that, right? We, we, are, you know, we, we have two or three people meeting the same candidate, and then we get together and we talk about the candidate and we make a joint decision. And you think that solves the problem. Wrong. It makes it worse. It actually makes it much worse. Why is that? Because when you talk about the candidate, you introduce bias. You introduce a group bias. You, you, you introduce the tendency of people to want to agree with the boss, the tendency of people to want to agree with one another. So if we've interviewed the same candidate, right, and you're my boss, and I hear you say, oh, I, I thought this candidate completely lacked leadership and had no present. Having heard you say that, how likely am I to say that actually in the interview with me, the candidate was very strong and present and, and striking? I might actually not mention it anymore because I'm afraid that I will come across as having a lower standard than you or worse judgment than you on this very important dimension. And maybe, by the way, we have a third and a fourth interviewer who just like me thought he had a lot of leadership but are not going to speak up now. The way to leverage the collective intelligence of the people who are making that decision is to make sure that before you start talking about the candidate, you make sure that each of them writes down their opinion about the candidate and that you have evaluated the candidate on all those dimensions before you start discussing your judgment with your colleagues. Are there any kind of like really common practices though that we just take for granted which actually aren't successful? Like when, when another funny example is brainstorming. We've known for decades again, since the, the, the late 60s I think, that this is actually less productive than getting people to generate ideas separately. And there's a number of reasons for that. When we have 10 people in the room, 10 people cannot speak at the same time, so you are simply dividing by 10 the productivity of everybody. When you write, you can all write at the same time, which of course makes you more productive. When you are all together, even if you're told to not censor yourself, you will censor yourself. You will not say the things that you think might offend or displease the other people in the room. So we, it's, it's not hard to understand why that happens. And yet, we keep doing brainstorming because it's fun. It's more fun than sitting in front of a piece of paper on your own and having to generate ideas. Decision making is hugely important in business. How do we balance the difference between risking making a bad decision and not making a decision at all? So one of the things that stops us when we have to make decisions, one of the things that delays the decision is the fear of making a bad decision. And the, the, the fear of not getting the result that we want. Now, I've just said two things which look like they're, which sound like they're synonymous, but it's very important to realize that they're not. We can make a good decision and fail. And we can make a terrible decision and because of a stroke of good luck, be very successful. But of course, what we care about is the outcome. So when we have to take a risk, there's a lot of things that we don't control. We're afraid that it's not going to be successful and we're going to be blamed for it. And that's a very sensible fear to have. But you want to create a climate of psychological safety, where people can actually express their worries about the decision, express a sense that a decision is risky. Your job is not to be successful every time. Your job is to make the best possible decision you can with the information you have. When you adopt that mindset, two things are going to happen. 
first that you're going to take the risks that are worth it. You're not going to fool yourself that you're making a safe decision when you're making a risky decision. The second thing is just as important is that if it turns out that it's not that successful, rather than throwing good money after bad and recommitting to a bad decision, you're going to say, well, it was a risky decision, it's not working out, let's move on to something else, let's cut our losses. So you're going to be a lot more flexible in your thinking. Then you will be making a lot more sound decisions and you will be much more flexible about how to deal with them as they unfold. So how should we approach decision making then? What are your tips for confidently making good decisions? First, make sure you have dissent. Dissent is good. Dissent is good and you probably, if you're the boss, you probably underestimate the degree to which people are censoring themselves. You think you're a nice person. You think people feel free to express themselves. Everybody feels that way. But research tells us, and interviews with the people on your team would tell us, that in fact, they hesitate to speak their mind when they disagree with you. And therefore, one thing to put in place is mechanisms, tools, techniques to get the dissent that you need to hear. For instance, you know, sometimes people say devil's advocates. I have another suggestion invented by a brilliant psychologist called Gary Klein, which is called the pre-mortem. The pre-mortem is a very simple tool where you take a couple of minutes, literally two minutes, and you ask people to write down what ha we are five years from now, this decision has been a disaster, what happened? And they write down you know, why this decision has been a disaster. That will get people to speak up about their worries in a way that they won't if you just ask them, so what are your worries? Because then they will say, oh no boss, your, your idea is great, I don't have any worries. Second idea, right before you speak. You know when you are in a meeting and you ask people, okay, so I want to hear what you all have to say about this because I, you know, I care about your point of view and I want to hear it. Brilliant, great. But you underestimate how much they're influencing each other and how much you're influencing them in that process. So when you, when you do that, tell them, look, I want to hear what you have to say. Why don't we all take two minutes and write down what we think about this proposal and then we will take turns to read what we've written down. Surely it helps like shy people as well because if someone maybe isn't confident speaking they would prefer so to write something down. And then It helps to make sure that the people who wouldn't naturally speak up do speak up because you make sure that everybody speaks in turns. It helps to make sure that the people who dissent actually voice their dissent rather than silencing it after they have heard one, two, three, four people you know, go in the same direction. It also, by the way, saves time, because instead of rambling incoherently, people will actually structure their thinking before they speak. So it's all benefit and very, very low cost. All it takes is two minutes. Right. Third very basic idea, you have an intuition about the decision you're going to make. Hold that thought, hold that intuition. Try to put it aside, it's hard, but try to put it aside and to ask yourself, if I didn't have any intuitions, what are the criteria I would use? How would I structure that decision? Who would I ask? What are the facts I would be looking for? So you're saying don't instinctively listen to your gut. Don't listen to your gut yeah. yet. Right. Now, once you've done all the homework, once you've heard all the dissenting opinions, once you've gotten all the data about all the elements of the structure of your decision, it will look like it's a tough decision because all the information will not go in the same direction. That's the time to bring back your intuition. Your intuition at the beginning of the decision process is really dangerous because it blinds you to some of the information that you need to get and to some of the dissent that you need to hear. Keep your intuition for the end. There we go, the magic formula for a successful business. So thank you, Professor Olivier Siboni at HEC Paris. Thanks for joining us on The Big Question. Thank you. Thank you.